Hello, I'm David Dumke, the director of the UCF Prince Mohammed bin Fahd Program for Strategic Research and Studies and the director of the Middle East Initiatives. It's a pleasure to have an old a friend here in Orlando. Welcome to uh, UCF, Kareem Hagag of American University, Cairo. Thank you, David. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, I know you've had a lot of talks since you've been in Orlando and conversations we've had many times in the past about what's going on in this this region, what's going on with U.S. policy in this region. But before we talk about that, I want to talk about what AUC is doing. It's got a 100th anniversary next year, and part of the project is looking at the Middle East in the future. So talk a little about that, and then I want to hear what your thoughts are on, on what this all means. Thank you, David. Appreciate the opportunity to engage with uh, the school and w with you and with the students. So that's a big question you threw my way. So yes, let's talk about AUC Centennial Project. Uh, next year marks 100 years since the establishment of the American University in Cairo. Uh, and to celebrate our 100th anniversary, the, the university is about to start a very ambitious project that looks to chart the different futures for our region, for the Middle East. And basically, the focus of the, of the project is to get people from the region, whether academics, policymakers, NGOs, opinion shapers, to have a very serious, in-depth discussion about where the region is going and to see if we can chart alternative futures for the Middle East. And so that involves grappling with very difficult questions related to regional security, regional conflicts, economic development and economic policy, and of course the very important and central social questions that are involved in much of the transformation that's going on uh, in the region. And so we hope to start a conversation about the Middle East by Middle Easterners. The premise being that Middle Easterners should take responsibility for their region, for understanding where our region is going, and if we want to push uh, our region in a more positive, hopeful direction, then what do we need to do in terms of the actual policies that need to be put in place to realize that better future? Well, it's interesting, and I was thinking about this a little last week as the world marked the end of a hundred years since the end of World War One, and of course the region since that time so much of what has happened has not been shaped necessarily by the people of the region but by outside actors of course at the end of World War One you had the Ottoman Empire which controlled much of the region for for centuries collapse and replaced rather than by governments of the people and by the people you had outsiders determining what the region's future should be, whether they be French, British colonists, whether they be after World War II in another era, you had Cold War prisms kind of shape a lot of the region's future. So, I mean, how much of the problem is actually that the region itself hasn't determined its own future solely, but it's always been in part of outside involvement or, or meddling if you want to be a little more negative. I would agree with the gist of uh, your analysis that the region has been one of the most uh, penetrated regions by external powers in the world. And as you rightly said, we, we've seen that since uh, the onset of the First World War and obviously uh, in the period before the First World War with the encroachment of imperialism by Great Britain, by France, by the traditional imperialist powers. The Middle East is a very important region. It's a very strategic region. But I think we, we have to distinguish between recognizing that fact that the Middle East will always be important to outside powers and between the necessity for people and governments in the region to propose solutions for their problems as opposed to blaming others for their problems or looking for those solutions outside the region. So yes, th this is not to deny a, the strategic reality that you described and that I would agree with, but the region has to take control of its own destiny. Now th these are very complicated problems. Taking responsibility doesn't mean necessarily mean isolating the region from the outside world 
or antagonizing external powers or ignoring their interests, uh, their very important interests in the region, but it means solutions that may n uh, entail working with others to address these very difficult problems of conflict, conflict resolution, uh, regional security, economic development, social development. So it, it entails taking back a certain sense of ownership while at the same time working with others to address these very difficult problems. One of my favorite parables that I always use in, in talking about foreign policy is the Indian parable of the blind men and the elephant, where they're all feeling a different part of the element and describing what an elephant is. And of course, they're all right, but they're all wrong. And I feel that way with my own country, United States, involvement in the Middle East, and not just the Middle East. You know, we fought a, a war in Vietnam, for example, where Americans chose to see that as a fight against communism as opposed to Vietnamese who largely saw that as a fight against colonialism and outside influence, both of which from a certain perspective and how you process the, the issue, of course, explained actions and, and justifications for it. Even today, though, as the United States looks at the region, there's a lot of criticism you know, uh, of 10 years ago, you know, Arab governance and democracy. This is what you should be doing. This is what you should be doing with human rights. And some of the criticisms, of course, are fair. Some of them I've always found are very unfair. Where does the United States and other outside players, where do they fit in in this region? And, you know, how do you reconcile these different visions of what is reality? And, you know, how do you work with someone who actually sees a very different picture? Yeah. The history and legacy of the involvement of the United States in the region is a very long one. It's a very problematic one, and, and it's a le legacy with mixed blessings. Right? I am not of the view that the record of U.S. foreign policy in the region is all bad or, or all good. Y you can reach a mixed assessment, I think. For example, the United States was instrumental in starting the Middle East peace process between Arabs and Israelis. The United States brokered and shepherded the first Arab-Israeli agreement between Egypt and Israel. After the historic initiative of the late President Sadat to reach out to Israel as, as the first Arab country to make peace, the United States moved in to actually secure uh, or make sure that that process uh, reached a successful conclusion with the signing of the Egyptian-Israeli Peace Treaty in 1979. And, and since then, the United States has made attempts to broaden the, the circle of Arab-Israeli peace with Jordan, with the Palestinians, with Syria unsuccessfully. But, but there has been an important contribution that we have to recognize with respect to America's involvement in the region. So that, that's one example. But of course, we can't ignore the fact that the other aspects of America's involvement in the region have been extremely problematic. I mean, we can't ignore the fact that the invasion of the 2003 invasion of Iraq was a major shock to the regional system. We had the collapse of a very central Arab state. We had the, the reality that that triggered an imbalance of power uh, in the region. We had, for the first time, the, the reality that terrorism has become a major feature of the regional landscape. Now, that's not necessarily to lay the blame for all of this at the doorstep of the United States, but the 2003 invasion did mark a very significant shift in how the region was organized and the overall regional balance that was the trigger of many of the problems we see today. And so the, the United States is an important player in the region. We can't ignore that. It is incumbent upon countries of the region to engage positively with the United States in charting a better future for the region. And that's a reality that I think regional countries have to contend with. I hear what you're saying on that. I don't necessarily disagree. I also would say, though, however, there's an, an obligation, if for no other reason than you want to have an effective foreign policy, to try to understand where your partners are going and where it's different and what are their interests. And in this age of, of nationalism, as, as the American president has supposedly championed, it doesn't allow for a lot of inclusion of other people's thoughts and ideas necessarily. And when you look at the 
history of the U.S. Egyptian relationship, modern times. There was an interest, obviously, uh, through President Sadat and President Carter and, and President Ford and Nixon even before, in having peace and having not just a, a, a peace process with Israel, but also promoting regional stability that's based on peace. And that's really justified the U.S.-Egyptian relationship, including foreign military assistance and economic assistance since that time. I would argue, however, that one of the problems is this relationship and several other U.S. relationships with key players in the Middle East is outdated. And there hasn't been a conscious attempt to reassess where are the common interests now and, and how do we promote them. And I think this is a real problem. You highlight an important point. I think it's important to recognize that both sides of this equation are undergoing their own assessments of what is their interests vis-a-vis uh, -vis the other. What are their priorities? How should the United States approach the region, uh, intervene in the region, engage with the region? And conversely, countries that had a very key relationship with the United States, such as Egypt, is also undergoing uh, its own assessment as to what this relationship should look like, how should it move forward, but always recognizing the reality that the United States remains uh, an important player. And just one, one example of that partnership between Egypt and the United States, it, it's, it's important to note, uh, just for the record, that when, when we talk about Arab-Israeli peace, Palestinian-Israeli peace uh, in particular, we have to remember that almost every major Israeli-Palestinian agreement was done in close cooperation between Egypt and the United States as partners in the cause for peace. And in that column, we, we could also note the first Gulf War, where Egypt partnered with the United States uh, to liberate Kuwait from Iraqi occupation. And so th there are these very important milestones that indicate that there can be a positive relationship between both countries, not only for their mutual interests, but also for the region itself. But I think the premise of your comment I is correct, in that both sides are going through this reassessment as to their interests and priorities. And so maybe this is a good opportunity for me to ask you, where is that reassessment going in the United States with regards to America's outlook to the region as a whole and to the strategic partnerships it has built with countries I in the region, including Egypt, including Israel, including Saudi Arabia, Turkey? It seems that a lot of these alliances are now in flux, as it were. Well, I think, you know, first of all, it's... Uh open season on criticizing the Trump administration and placing heaping blame on them and, and with a complete justification in many cases. And I've been critical myself, but what's going on in the Middle East isn't, isn't exclusive to this administration. It actually goes back several administrations. I remember hearing uh, Colin Powell not long after he had left the Clinton administration in the 90s he, he was talking to an audience and he had had questions that were critical of, of Bill Clinton's foreign policy and why do we seem weak and this, if you recall this was after a debacle in Somalia and, and several other missteps and Powell didn't necessarily defend Clinton but he said look you got to understand the world is much more complicated now uh, it was black and white as we saw it in the Cold War but now it's gray almost entirely I keep thinking of that because the U.S. has been very slow to adjust to new changes in the world and, and in the region. And I think, unfortunately, um, this is especially true in, in the Middle East. We saw ourselves as the lone superpower, the winner of the Cold War, and therefore that meant our influence in the region, not just the Middle East, but we're talking about the Middle East region, increased to a point where instead of, for example, having a true partnership with Egypt where there were noticeable deliverables, especially in a world where you're competing with some other force, to a world where, okay, we've been working with Egypt on the peace process, we've been working on military cooperation, on, on, um, on other efforts, but now perhaps we're still providing assistance to this country, but it's an absence of an opponent, if you will in the bigger picture of the globe. So maybe it's time for us to say, all right, this country has some internal problems, some internal 
challenges it needs to address, maybe we can use our aid to compel them to change or prod them to change. This has always been done quietly in foreign policy, but it became more, in my opinion, sharper criticism. And the concept of leverage was bandied, bandied about. So we give aid, therefore you should do this, which didn't take into account sensitivities. And I'm using Egypt specifically because I'm talking to you, but this, this was true in other, other places as well. What we've lost track of, to go back to my Colin Powell situation, is kind of what we want. It's pretty hard to navigate a ship, and I'm paraphrasing a Greek scholar. Uh, it's pretty difficult to find a port when you're in a ship if you don't know what port you're trying to find. I think the U.S. lacks a policy, so it's pretty hard to figure out what we're doing in the region, what we want of our partners, what we expect when we don't know what we're trying to get. So this is a problem. So what we've done instead is we have a series of tactics with countries, with the region. Those tactics don't fit, fit into a strategy, and I know that's a pretty broad answer. But it's one part of the puzzle, because if, if you m move to the regional side and, and ask the question, what does the region want from America? you also get a confused answer, or di different answers. On the one side, you, you have a tendency from the region to blame the United States for all of the problems facing the Middle East. And, and that's certainly been very discernible if you look at the discourse, the political discourse in the region, laying the blame for our problems at the doorstep of the United States. But at the same time, you find that despite that criticism, there is a, a real yearning for the United States to step back and play a role uh, in the region. And that may be out of the recognition that a lot of the problems, that finding a solution to a lot of the problems in the region does require some sort of U.S. role. So while, yes, countries in the region and pe the peoples of the region have to take responsibility and ownership for addressing these problems, th there is a recognition that that will be extremely difficult without some sort of positive involvement or positive engagement on the part of the United States with, with the region. And, and so you have this mixed assessment as to what exactly do we want uh, as a region from the United States. And, and it seems to me that that should be the rationale for a much deeper conversation between both sides than what currently exists today. I think I was struck by what you mentioned about the transactional approach that seems to be a prevalent feature of American foreign policy today. You know, w what can we get today for our uh, involvement or for our assistance or for our intervention? You know, what, what's in it for me today? Or I think what's needed is a much more strategic approach on both sides to really grapple with how can the question of how can both sides engage positively with each other to move the region in a more positive direction. I think one thing you're, you're mentioning that's, that's true and it's in the region, it's in the United States, it's, it's really a global phenomenon right now and not a, not a positive one either <laughs> is we're really lacking foresight among leaders. We're really not dealing with visionary strategies. I mean, I look at something in, in North America, for example, that was uh, is, is a cornerstone of our, our economy now, which is the North American Free Trade Agreement. But some of the reasons for that, for example, you know, immigration is a big domestic political issue. We don't want immigrants from, from Mexico coming and stealing American jobs, and we don't want NAFTA as a ripoff that causes our companies to flee to Mexico. Some of the rationale for NAFTA's creation in the first place was to create a viable Mexican middle class so you wouldn't have immigration, so you would have a more stable region. You weren't going to see that overnight, but you were going to see that over 25, 30 years. This is a vision that was shared by both political parties in the United States, by the business community, by many. And by the way, you could also include things such as labor standards in there, environmental standards, not perfect but at least it created a, a, a benchmark. This kind of visionary policy 
uh, I don't see adopted anywhere, including in, in the uh, Middle East, the U.S. approach to the Middle East. I look at the U.S.-Egyptian relationship. When was the last time we tried to move beyond? And I go back to the Gore Mubarak Initiative, which looked at business and kind of a way to move away, f away from assistance and even some of the transactional uh, nature of the relationships into more sustainable relationships, whether they're based on trade or, or culture or many other components that include this. I don't see that happening. I don't know how we get leadership to respond to this. I mean, you know, you look at Egypt, and this isn't a criticism of Egypt's president, but you have a lot of problems at home, and so a lot of the effort is focused on stabilizing the economy, stabilizing the security situation, stabilizing the politics after a very volatile period, and doing it in a, in a, in a regional atmosphere that's also very tense and turbulent. So the priorities there, it's, it's easy for me to say, oh, no one's being visionary and looking ahead, because so many of the priorities are looking at just keeping things alive. I mean, wh what do you think of that? I think we're coming to the same conclusion, but maybe from different sides of the problem. Um, uh, I mean, I, I, I said a moment ago that both sides are engaging in a, in a reassessment of their relationship, but more broadly their foreign policy interests and their foreign policy outlook uh, in general. A and I think you outlined the reasons why. I mean, with respect to Egypt, Egypt has gone through a very difficult period that started with the revolution of 2011, followed by a very difficult transition during which the Muslim Brotherhood reached power and which triggered another revolution that completely rejected the foundation of the Muslim Brotherhood regime, which is the use of religion as uh, an extension of politics and, and, and as a means to govern Egyptian society. So it's been a very difficult period. And then if you add to that, as you mentioned, everything going on in the broader regional landscape, with the onset of conflict on Egypt's borders. I mean, if you look at what's happening in Libya, we have 1,000-kilometer uh, border with Libya to our west, a major conflict that's been a source of radicalism, terrorism, weapons proliferation, smuggling. And so this is a very difficult situation, not to mention the situation in Syria, uh, in Yemen, uh, in the Arab-Israeli context, the, the Israeli-Palestinian context uh, in particular. So th there, there is this onset of challenges with which a country like Egypt is, is trying to grapple. And in that context, we have to reassess how does the U.S.-Egyptian relationship fit into that very complex, very difficult picture. And on the U.S. side, I think y you have also the administration and the constituents that have an interest in foreign policy grappling with very difficult, a very difficult situation. You have the effects of the 2008 economic crisis still playing out d domestically. You have questions being asked about why the United States should adopt a very proactive engagement in terms of its foreign policy with other regions of, of the world. And, and those are questions that the United States has to figure out and has to sort out. But I think w what's important a as we, as both sides sort out and address the, these problems. We will have to come back to this question, as you said, as what do we want from this relationship between the, the, the United States and Egypt? And we, we have to come at this with a fresh approach. But I think we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that this was, and I think continues to be, a very valuable relationship. The United States and Egypt did do good things together. And they did have differences of views on certain issues, regional issues, issues with respect to domestic politics, as I think you, you mentioned. But we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that the United States-Egyptian relationship was, to a large extent, a force, a positive force in regional politics, and a force for regional stability, and hopefully a force for peace. So as we come back and reassess this relationship sometime in the future, I think we shouldn't lose sight of that very important aspect. I agree completely, and I even look at, at, at something like I've mentioned assistance and leverage and you know these, these kind of negative connotations based on my comments, but you look at some of, the, some of the good that's been done through these projects that 
have benefited Egypt and benefited the region, whether it's it's uh, infrastructure projects or human development or health in particular, have really really been beneficial and can be a sign of goodwill that actually encourages conversations that are positive and constructive on on other issues. And I think there's just so many key issues that aren't may not be as sexy right now as looking at security and terrorism and you know but issues like water resources which is a huge issue food security these are things that have been kind of talked about on the side for a long time and not really dealt with seriously but really that is so critical to political stability regional stability and really they're going to be of increasing importance not just regionally but globally so there are plenty of issues out there on which we could work constructively and you know some of the the technology that could be shared the best practices there's a lot of lessons to be learned out there and i think we just need to not be stuck on the same issues that in many ways are yesterday's issues and in other ways are issues you can't move forward productively anyway. So we need to find areas where we actually can advance. No, I agree. I think uh, 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 one, one very interesting part of uh, the story of Egyptian-American relations is that it didn't just deal with the issues of high politics, of war and peace, of terrorism, of regional security, but it involved a very tangible component that focused on development, and the United States played a very significant role in Egypt's overall economic development ever since the, the signing of the Egyptian-Israeli Peace Treaty and, uh, and, uh, and after that. So I think, yeah, you're, you're right. We shouldn't lose sight. Again, what has been a very positive foundation that we need to build on. But maybe we need to build on that foundation a different structure with a different approach. But we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that there is this very strong foundation that's been there. And that's uh, endured during very difficult times. I mean, throughout the, the different crises that you and I have been talking about, we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that with all of its problems, the U.S.-Egyptian strategic partnership has been a reality and has survived during very difficult times. So hopefully that could be a foundation on which we build something new with a new approach. Well, we're not starting from scratch, nor are we going to solve all these problems, but it's still good to have you down here, and I thank you for, for coming, coming by. Thank you, David. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me.